Amen. All right. Well, tonight we are at lesson four, and we are going to talk about what a missionary is and, and does. So last week we talked about, well, jump back even further in that week two, we defined what the mission of the church was. And uh, week three, we talked about, uh, when we talk about the mission of the church, we talked about uh, when you're talking about the mission of the church, it's easy to think on an individual level, right? Especially in our society in our day. But we're talking about the local church, um, how the local church is called to fulfill the Great Commission. We talked about 11 ways that the Bible gives um, to how churches work together. At, as, as a local church, the members work together as one body to see that um, that mission accomplished, and tonight we're going to talk about what those people who actually are sent from the church, um, what they are and what they do. Um, it goes without saying, I'm, so I've, I've said it a few times before, that the way I'm using the word missionary, um, as I'm making a distinction between what I feel like is the biblical call, you know, we are all called to evangelize. We're all called to make disciples. Um, we're all called to engage um, in the Great Commission, in some ways, I talked about the people who are called to stay. You know, they're called to give. They're called to pray. Um, but the Bible does give a certain, there are people set apart for this specific task. So the phrase, everyone is a missionary, um, in, in, it, in a strictest sense, it is not really completely accurate. You know, usually what people mean by that, they mean everybody is called to make disciples and evangelize. Which in that sense of the word, yes, you know, but we're going to talk about this distinct calling um, that God gives certain people um, to whose job description is to fulfill the Great Commission. Um, so we're going to look about that in detail. Um, so let's start off with the definition of missionary, what a missionary is. This is somewhat adapted by uh, David Platt in the IMB. He had a definition, and so I, I stole a lot of it and reworded some things and so it's primarily used by the IMB, which I found was very helpful. Um, but here's, here's what we're going to talk about tonight. Let's define what a missionary is um, and what they do. Missionaries are those who are called out by God, sent out from a local church, who cross cultural, linguistic, or geographical barriers, along with a team of other believers, in order to preach the gospel, make disciples, establish churches, and train leaders in unreached areas and places. Um, so we're going to kind of walk through that definition some, most of it tonight, and maybe the, some parts of it next week, Lord willing, we'll see. Um, so let's kind of walk through that definition tonight, um, just kind of little by little with some scriptural references. Um, so let's talk about the first part of the definition is that a missionary is someone that is called by God and sent out by a local church. Um, so Acts 13 is a great place to start. Um, so let's look at Acts 13 together. Um, this is, we're going to, this is where Paul and Barnabas have their first calling and are sent out from the church. It says, Now there were in the church at Antioch prophets and teachers, um, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manian, a lifelong friend of Herod the Tetrarch, and, and Saul. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. Very cool passage. Um, really cool uh, fact about the Apostle Paul, I'm kind of getting ahead of myself here, is that you know when, when he was kicked off his donkey and the Lord kind of gave him his apostolic vision, it's really interesting that this is like 14 to 16, somewhere around that, time frame years later where he's actually sent out it's a pretty interesting fact there um, but what do we have here we have um, we, we we have this concept of call that Paul and Barnabas were called by God um, the church of Antioch which is really cool again this is again uh, not part of what we're really talking about but how does the local church work together you know this this church in Antioch who, who planted this church this church was planted by normal believers who were scattered because of the persecution of Stephen, and they took the gospel with them where they went. And it came to this amazing church being founded and planted. Again, this is just how the body works together in order to see the Great Commission finished. 
Um, so we see God, um, we see some things happening. God calling Paul and Barnabas in the church, affirming that, and sending them off. Um, so w- what I want to begin is, you know, we're to, we to find a missionary as someone who's called out by God. So let's start talking about the, how does someone know they are called by God for this work? Because that's part of the definition. Someone who is called by God sent out the church. Um, let, let, let's talk about that because we might think, you know, Apostle Paul, I mentioned his, you know, when, when Christ appeared to him, you may say, well, it was easy for him. Jesus appeared to him and knocked him off the horse, donkey, whatever it was. And he was blinded and, and, and he heard the audible voice of Jesus. So it was easy for him. And he said, that'll never happen to me. And yes, that will never happen to you. You will never have a revelation like that, like the Apostle Paul did. Primarily, what we're going to see tonight is that many of the people who are called by God in Scripture, it was not something extremely miraculous, supernatural in that sense. Um, So tonight, um, let's walk through, actually, how does a person know they're called to missions? And you could really apply this to, 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 to ministry in general. Um, but we won't we won't go that route, um, and I'll do kind of a more of a condensed version. Um, but let's look at some scripture references. I mean, how do we know we're called? Do we have a a, a warm feeling? Um, do we hear a voice? Is it a, do we get a sign from God? I mean, you've you've heard I've heard some pretty crazy stories out there, you know. Like I would go to I've actually heard somebody say this that everywhere they went they just started seeing this this country everywhere written everywhere, right? And, and, and they confirm, you know. Now, is that, could that be used by God? Um, maybe, right? But when I'm over there in a country like that, and I'm, I'm suffering for the Lord and labor and the going gets tough, like I want more than the fact that I saw the country's name <laughs> everywhere on a cereal box or, or whatever. Um, you know, you kind of want something more founded than that. But what happens? Let's look at a few instances uh, let's first look at Paul um, in Romans fifteen eighteen through 21. He says, For I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me to bring the Gentiles to obedience by word and deed, by the power of signs and wonders, by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem and all the way around to Illyricum, I have fulfilled the ministry of the gospel of Christ, and thus I make it my ambition to preach the gospel where Christ has not already been named, lest I build on someone else's foundation. But as it is written, those who have never been told of him will see, and those who have never heard will understand. So we have here Paul um, talking about, you know, this is him later on in life as a missionary, um, talking about his calling and ambition. What drove him and inspired him? He says, I make it my ambition. His, his passion in the ministry at this point in his life was to take the gospel to people who have never heard it before. Right? And he wasn't expecting the church of Rome, you, you, sh- you need to be doing this too. Right? He, you know, he, he's not expecting them to have that same calling. Right? He actually encourages them for being a solid, healthy church and says, hey, I want to come see y'all. And you could you know, send me on my way to, to Rome. Um, so he's, he's not saying that this is the same ambition that everyone has. Um, yes, it's a goal everyone has, but again, this church, of the church of Rome was to help him and to partake in that work by giving him money and praying for him, of course. Um, but Paul had a desire. He talks about his desire. He said, I'll make it my ambition. So Paul had a strong yearning for this type of work. He had a burden for this work. Um, So he had a strong desire. Let's look and see what what his desire um, was founded upon. Um, He did not say that his desire, I mean, I'm sure he could, but he did not hear. He didn't say, the reason I want to do this work is because Jesus kicked me off the donkey and I had this Damascus Road experience. I mean, he could say that, but what does he do? He points to a text. He says, um, 
But as it is written, those who have never been told of him will see, and those who have never heard will understand. He's talking about Isaiah 52, Isaiah 53, where it talks about the gospel or the, the suffering servant purchasing a, with his blood people from many nations and people who would never see, who had never heard, will hear and will see. And so he's driven um, with a desire by what he saw God doing in redemptive history where God was going to, in Christ, gather Gentiles from every, every tribe, tongue, and nation. And he got excited about that work. And that was a burning desire in him to do it. So, I say all that to say, uh, what I'm wanting to do is just to kind of redeem back the unmiraculous calling of God on people's lives. Yes, it's, it's miraculous and it's supernatural, but when I'm saying miraculous, I'm talking about people think in order to know whether they're called to go that they need some crazy sign in order to, for, it, for it to know. And I'm simply saying that biblically speaking, you know, we don't necessarily um, need some sign. And Paul, he's just simply saying, I had a desire based upon what God was doing in redemptive history. Um, and then we'll also see that he also had the giftedness to actually accomplish that. right? So we talked about how he was, this is roughly 16 years before I mean, when he sent on in Antioch, but you read Acts, what's he doing before then? He's reasoning in the synagogues. He's, he's more of an, a, a, almost like a, 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 poly, a, a apologist, you know, like debating the Jews and trying to win souls, and, and he's doing it, right? And, um, and he's gifted for the work. Um, and so, so when, when Barnabas is wanting to go to, to the, the church of Antioch to kind of build them up and to mature them, uh, he he's goes and he goes find Saul first. He says he'll be he'll be useful. He knew he, Paul would be useful to him because of Paul's giftedness and character and such. So he wanted to take Paul with him. So you see Paul having a desire based upon what God was doing in redemptive history, along with the God giving gifts and abilities to do that work. Okay? Um, so you have desire and ability. So some, let's look at some other examples. Let's look at Timothy. Paul came also to Derby and Lystra. A disciple was there named Timothy, the son of a Jewish woman who was a believer, but his father was a Greek. He was well spoken of by the brothers at Lystra and Iconium. Paul wanted to take Timothy to accompany him. So what made Paul choose Timothy? Right. Why? Because Timothy was a faithful disciple and he was well spoken of by the believers there. Right? He was essentially a, a faithful disciple of Jesus who had been ser obviously serving and being and ministering in the area where he was. And the churches were like, he's a blessing. You know? Um, and they, they, they vouched for him. And Paul was like, this, this, this guy will be useful to me. And he says, I want to I take him. Right, so you have here, you don't really see Timothy's desire um, here, but you, what you do see is you see a desire that is fleshed out in faithful service to the church, so much so that the church sees it and could tell Paul, yeah, Timothy, he would be worth it. You should, you should take him. And Paul says, all right, Timothy, let's go. Again, is that really super miraculous in the sense of the word? No. You see, Timothy uh, obviously had a heart, for the church and a minister, heart for the people of God, and you, you see that the people there affirm that in him, right? Um, all right, let's look at some other stuff. Um, I love this one. This is for Luke. It says, um, um, And as much as many have undertaken to compile the narrative of the things that have been accomplished among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word have delivered them to us, it seemed good to me also, having followed all these things closely for some time past, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent uh, Theophilus, that you may have certainty concerning the things you've been taught. Well, I, I really love this one. Right, because Paul will, will quote Luke's gospel and refer to it as the sacred writings. He'll use the same word that is used to refer to the, to the, the Hebrew scriptures. So he's, a, you know, Luke wrote the God, you know, one of the books of the gospel, God-breathed, inspired, completely inerrant book. But what, what made him want to do it? 
He said, it seemed good to me that I should do this. He had a desire, and he did it, right? And, it was, and God was working in his desires, and of course he had, you know, one thing that I'm not talking about, I'm not talking about God's providence and all of this, right? So usually people talk about when, you know, you could get more detailed. I'm just doing two basic principles, um, the internal desire and the external affirmation of the church. I mean, we could talk about God's providence and things about that, about how a desire plus giftedness and affirmation plus providence, right? I could say I want to call to preach all day long, or somebody could say they're called to preach all day long and say they have the gifts and maybe even be affirmed. But if God's not opening up opportunities for them to do it, you know, you could just say maybe so, but not yet, you know. Um, or you could say maybe not, but, but more likely not yet. Um, but what we're seeing here is I'm just sh- trying to show this in scriptural, after scriptural after scriptural examples of, you know, Luke just said it seemed good to me. Right. Later on in Acts, when they're writing up, they have this huge debate uh, about uh, circumcision and such. They want to write a letter. They finally resolve it and they want to write a letter and send it to all the Gentile churches. And what they say, it seemed good to us and to the Holy Spirit to write this. Right. So they're, 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 that desire, God's providence and God's des- and the desire is, is fleshed out. Right. So Paul, so Luke here is just, you know. He's not saying, you know, Jesus came and kicked me off a donkey and said, write oh, the gospel, you know. But he said, it seemed good to me. And God was working in his desires um, to accomplish his will. Let's look at another one. This one's probably my favorite. Well, I said Luke was my favorite. I don't know which one's my favorite. Man, my thing's all messed up. Sorry. Um, let's look at Nehemiah. Nehemiah 4, 1 through 11. As soon as I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned. So he's talking about he, he's the cupbearer of the king in exile, and uh, he heard a report of his home, his homeland, Israel. It says, as soon as I heard that it was destroyed, um, and, and, and it laid, the city gates laid in ruins, he said, as soon as I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned for days, and I continued fasting and praying before the God of heaven. And I said, O Lord, God of heaven, the great and awesome God, who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments, let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer of your servant, that I now pray before you day and night for the people of Israel, your servants, confessing the sins of the people of Israel, which we have sinned against you. Even I and my father's house have sinned. We have acted corruptly against you and have not kept the commandments, the statutes, and the rules that you've commanded your servant Moses. Remember the word that you commanded your servant Moses, saying, If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the peoples. But if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, though your outcasts are in the uttermost parts of heaven, from there I will gather them and bring them to the place that I've chosen to make my name dwell there. They are your servants and your people whom you have redeemed by your great power and by your strong hand. O Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your servants who delight to fear your name and give success to your servant today and grant him mercy in the sight of this man. So Nehemiah is broken over the news and his heart is broken and burdened. He weeps and fasts for many days. In verse 8, he reminds God of his promise. So God had promised um, in the, the covenant, stipulate covenant curses and um, blessings that if in the curses, the curse was exile. But if even he promised in exile, if they confessed their sins and would repent, that God would bring, bring them back into the promised land. So he grabs a hold of that promise and says, remember what you said, Lord. And he's confessing the sins of Israel. He's confessing it. Um, and then what does he do? Then what does he do? He goes and he says, Okay, Lord, give me favor now on the side of this king. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask him if I can get time off and if he'll pay for the way in the supplies. <laughs> you know, and I pray you give me favor. What happens? God gives him favor and he goes and he does it. So, it doesn't tell us that God said, okay, Nehemiah, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go do this. I want you to go do that. I want you to go do this. 
right? Maybe, but what we see in Scripture um, is that, again, you have a, a desire and a brokenness. He's broken over the need, you know, and has a desire to do it and, uh, and sees that it's based upon the biblical mandate, uh, and then you could also say Providence was also working. He was also in an opportunity where God provided for him to do it. Um, so Nehemiah would have probably described his calling to rebuild the walls like this. Well, once I heard the news, it pricked my heart. I was burdened and broken over what happened. I was reminded of God's promise, so I continued to pray and fast and confess sin to God. I had a desire then to do something about it. I know God had promised that if Israel would repent, he would return them from exile. So I had a desire to see that happen. I prayed about it and asked God for favor with the king so that I could go and do the task. God gave us favor. And if you read the rest of the book, here's what you'll see. It was hard work. A lot of obstacles. But God gave us the strength and the victory. I mean, there were times where it looked like the doors were shutting in their face to go. There was obstacle after obstacle. But you know, but God gave the grace to do it. Um, so this does not sound super spiritual in the sense of maybe, you know, it's very spiritual. You know, a desire based upon God's word, that's spiritual. But when we think of spiritual, we're thinking the miraculous, the signs and wonders. Um, and essentially, in the scriptures, you usually don't see these extreme signs happening. Um, so calling is usually... It's usually a desire based upon a biblical principle with a God-given ability to do that work that is affirmed by the church, by the local church. Um, again, and, and, and so usually people have kind of broken down the call of God and discerning it into two categories. Um, the subjective call, that's the desire. That's saying, I have a desire to do the work. I'm burdened for this. I want to see this happen. And then there's also... Again, within the sense of calling, the objective call, where you have the local church which you serve, that know you well, that know your character, that know your, your track record, um, and will we'll affirm that and say, yes, you know, we, we can see that, that, you know, you've, been a, you've served the Lord faithfully. You know, they could vouch for the character. And we could also add, and then God in his, I don't know why it says 1-1, one, one, um, should say 1-2, um, <laughs> but then we could also add God's providence, God's providence, and then opening up the doors for that work to be to be done. Um, it's very important. So a person really can't biblically stand upon whether they're called to missions unless both of these things are happening. You know, it's not saying that somebody can do this wrong and not truly be called by God, but you have these things working in the Scripture. So what does it mean to be called by God and sent out from the church? It means to have a desire um, that is affirmed by your local church. And things that the church will look at is character and, uh, and gifts and be able to affirm that. So you really have these things working together. Um, so a person could have confidence they're called to missions if they have a desire with the spiritual gifts necessary and their local church affirms all of these, all of these in them. Okay, let's look at the second part of a definition. A missionary is someone a part of a missionary team. This is huge because we think individualistic about calling, about church, like I said earlier, um, and also about what it means to be a missionary. Um, so actually nowhere in the scripture do you see anyone, any missionary traveling alone. Nowhere. You have Jesus sent the disciples out two by two. In Acts 13, Paul and Barnabas are sent out. And then when later on, when Paul and Barnabas split, um, Paul takes Titus, or Titus or Silas? Silas, I wrote Titus. Silas and Barnabas takes Mark. Um, not only that, but we also see numerous texts where there were other companions too. Um, some of them women, right? Uh, just companions. So you see this team dynamic in the New Testament. And I think there are multiple factors as to why God and his wisdom would make it that way. Um, you know, one could be accountability. So even in the Old Testament law, an accusation could not be, um, could be, not be made on the testimony, but of, of two or more witnesses, right? So you have uh, having another person keeps a safety net to the integrity of the team, right? So there's accountability there, you know? Again, I mean, accountability for numerous reasons. 
I mean, you, you, there's some self-motivation that needs to, one needs to have in order to, you're your own boss, you set your own schedule, right? So not, you know, making sure you're working, you know, um, having somebody to confide in, you know, um, about the struggles. So having somebody to, to have accountability with the personal walk with, with the Lord. So many reasons for accountability. Um, number two, encouragement. So it's, I think it's impossible to do ministry alone. That's why God made teams. Um, so God provides us a team um, for the sake of encouragement. I mean, I know really the people who do it well um, are, are those overseas who are on a team who see their first role as to care for one another other than to, to reach out to people first. I do think that that's the scriptural, scriptural mandate. Um, so you have some, hey guys, y'all need to take a date night. We're going to watch your kids tonight. Um, you know, you, y'all, you just need some husband and wife time or, or whatever. So you have Teams are, are that will put the priority of carrying one another and doing the one another's to one another, um, do it best. Um, which leads to three, it's very much similar, mutual love. Um, they're able to care for one another's needs. And then as they, they love one another, we talked about this last week, it's a public demonstration of the power of the gospel. So Jesus says, they will know you're my disciples by your love for one another. And then also, range and gifting. God has designed the body to be dependent upon one another. And so the body of Christ has a range of different giftings that the Spirit has given each member in order to build the body up as a whole. And the same is for missionary teams. So God is crafting and and raising up missionaries who are called by God to go out together. And within that team, you will have a wide range of gifts, personalities, and ways ways each individual can contribute. The, The goal... And the objective is the same, but the way that person might contribute to seeing that goal made is different. So when we think of the term missionary, it's easy for us to think Paul, you know, Barnabas, you know, Timothy and Titus, and these they're preaching and teaching and appointing elders and, and stuff. And th- that is true. Um, but we also need a category that isn't a cookie cutter like that. Right, Paul. Well, well, he he talks about women who were co-laborers with him. You know, he talks and 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 so when we think missionary, think not just on an individual level. Because if we only just thought Paul, when we thought of a missionary, there, you know, what would some women? What would women do? What would people without gift preaching and teaching um, gifts do? I mean, I guess their missions is not for them. No, it's it it is. Um, but they would just be a, need to be a part of a team um, and would serve and use their gifts in different ways. Um, um, okay, so I, I thought this was very helpful. David Platt and the IMB actually have a definition for missionary team. They say a missionary team is an identifiable group of disciples who meet together regularly, care for each other selflessly, partnering with one another intentionally, to make disciples and multiply churches among particular unreached peoples and or places. All right, let's talk about a third part of that. A missionary is someone who is dedicated to preaching the gospel, making disciples, planning churches, and training leaders. Um, so last week, we or a couple weeks ago, um, we established that what the mission of the church is and looked at the Great Commission, and then it's worth using Greg Gilbert and Kevin DeYoung's definition again, the mission of the church is going into the world and make disciples by declaring the gospel of Jesus Christ and the power of the Spirit and the gathering these disciples into churches that they might worship the Lord and obey His commands now and in eternity to the glory of God the Father. So from a biblical standpoint, the Great Commission, or this is just in man's words, um, the Great Commission is really the job description of the missionary. Right, so missionaries will do a lot of great things, like feed the poor, um, help widows and orphans, and I mean, gosh, they they better do that stuff, right? As Christians, <laughs> you know, <laughs> but um, that stuff in itself is good works and are is wonderful and called by God to do. But um, but the ultimate goal um, and the, and the 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 
driving force of everything that they do is for the ultimate goal of church planning. Again, so you may have people gifted in different areas, right, where they're not preachers or teachers. They may be gifted at just mentoring, y- you know, single women or um, or one-on-one counseling or just, you know, more relational type stuff, right? And so so they w- you won't see them appointing and laying hands, right, um, and, and appointing elders, but what you will see them is sharing the gospel with people, loving people, helping make disciples, um, and even the good works that they do um, are hopefully, and Lord willing, opportunities to bring eternal needs to people. And so the ultimate goal is for the ultimately disciples and churches to be planted. Um, and so we see this from a biblical standpoint. I mean, I, I got a lot of different examples, but I mean, you could just look at, if you want to open, I don't, I don't have it here, but Acts 13, um, just to kind of do a quick survey through some of it. You know, after Paul and Barnabas are sent off, what work do they begin to do? You know, Acts 13, it, right off the bat, it says, So being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia, and from there they sailed to Cyprus. When they arrived at Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God in the synagogue to the Jews. So they were preaching the word of God. Again, this is what do missionaries do? Let's just start from the text. What does missionary? What do missionaries do? Acts 13 again. Now Paul and his companions set sail from Paphos and came to Pergia and Pamphylia, and John left them and returned to Jerusalem. But they went on from Perga and came to Antioch and Pisidia, and on the Sabbath day they went to the synagogue and sat down. After the reading from the law and the prophets, the rulers of the synagogue sent a message to them saying, Brothers, if you have a word of encouragement for the people, say it. Man, do you want to talk about... (laughs) Yeah, you want to talk about a softball pitch there. That actually happened to me one time. Uh, when I was, sorry, I'm going off topic here, but um, when I was out doing ministry, uh, in, 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 I was doing inner city ministry for a few years, and some days I'd go to share the gospel, and I would actually be by myself because somebody um, didn't show or whatever from church, and I had a few hours scheduled, and I'm like, well, this is all I had planned today. So, you know, and I wasn't preaching or teaching every week, and so it literally, you know, I always, now I have that to fall back on. Well, I'll go study or I'll go prepare. Um, but <laughs> so many times, so many times, um, I could not open my mouth to anyone. Coward. I would go back home discouraged and, uh, and just be like, Lord, you know, this is going back to how the church does this. It's through, you know, it's interesting that the church prayed and fasted and, and you know these men were. And I was like, Lord, I just need your help. I'm a coward. I pray you would open up doors for me. And then I would walk out on two different occasions. Um, well, one different one occasion. Well, um, I was walking uh, down the, the neighborhood, and this one gentleman he had never talked to me about spiritual things before. He just walked up to me. He's like, "Man, I need prayer. Come pray for me, man. I'm, I got these decisions to make." Blah blah blah. And he just opened up his soul to me. And I was just like, and that was literally, you know, a hundred yards from my house after walking out the door. Another instance did the same thing. Um, we. Um, I was carrying around Bibles. So I was going to pass them out. And this one gentleman, was, a few of them were just uh, on their front porch. And he was like, hey, what you got there? <laughs> and I was like, well, glad you ask. You know, um, here's some scripture. But man, it reminds me of that. <laughs> um, anyway, so Paul stood up and nothing within his hands. Um, and then Paul preaches. So Paul, so Paul stood up and motioning with his hands. Paul then preaches Christ. And it says, and when the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord. And as many as were appointed to eternal life believed. So the word is going forth. As a result, in Paul's preaching, Acts 13, and the disciples were filled with joy in the Holy Spirit. So disciples being made. So already you see the gospels proclaimed, disciples are made. Um, on and on and on. Acts 14, 1 through 6, now at Iconium, they entered the together into a Jewish synagogue and spoke in such a way that a great number of Jews and Greeks believed. So they're speaking. So we're just seeing that this is primarily missions is a gospel ministry. It's a word-based ministry. No matter what you do on the field and in that realm of a team, the word is the centrality. That's your ultimate job description. Acts, well, it'll go on to say, and there they continued to preach the gospel. Acts 14, 21 through 23 when they had preached the gospel to that city and had made many disciples, 
they returned to Lystra, to Iconium, and to Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples and encouraging them to continue in the faith and saying that through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. And when they had appointed elders for them in every church with prayer and fasting, they committed them to the Lord in whom they had believed. Right, so we see all of these things happening. We have the gospel being preached, disciples being made and strengthened, and leadership being appointed. Acts 15, 36, And after some days, Paul said to Barnabas, Let us return and visit the brothers in every city where we proclaim the word of the Lord and see how they are. Acts 15, 41, And when they went through Syria and Sicilia, strengthening the churches. Acts 16, um, And when Paul had seen the vision immediately, we sought to go into Macedonia, uh, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. So, gospel, um, I could go on, but we get the picture with Paul and Barnabas in Acts. They're traveling around, preaching the gospel, appointing elders, building up and strengthening the disciples. Okay, so fact, Acts is very obvious. Let's look at some other books. Um, First and Second Timothy, um, First Timothy three six um, fourteen through sixteen. I hope to come to you soon, but I'm writing these things to you so that if I delay, you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God. Right. So Paul is, you know, Timothy was his companion. Um, Paul um, took him to to many places, mentored him, and did a lot of work together. And um, Timothy was actually charged to to remain in Ephesus. And, and he was literally given um, the role of doing what Paul would, would, you know, would, would, would have done. You know, but you know, Timothy wasn't the authority. It was the apostolic teaching that was. But, but essentially, um, Timothy was, was, was left in Ephesus to help the churches that had been planted to grow into maturity. So we don't see the whole unreached pioneer thing happening here. What we do have is a, someone who has still crossing cultural and you know barriers here but is staying to the churches that have been planted and is and is laboring almost as a pastoral type role overseeing them to train up leaders and to preach the gospel and such um, so we'll talk about this more later but it's worth men mentioning that the things that Paul called Timothy to do and again Timothy's a missionary right so he's he's different you know he I'm sure he did help Paul plant churches in unreached people groups but right now he's in a in a somewhat reached place trying to disciple these churches, and he's called to, he was called to refute false teaching, teaching right doctrine and the true gospel. He was called to teach um, how men and women were to act in the church, so godliness in the context of um, gender roles. Uh, he's called to appoint elders, raise up and train other leaders, teach the church how to live godly lives, give instructions on how the church should care for its widows, and handle disobedient elders. So we have here, the, again, we're seeing the word here central and the local church central here. Um, and then Titus. Titus is the same thing, same as Timothy. Um, he says, this is why I left you in Crete, so that you might put what remained in order and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. And so Titus was called to appoint elders, refute false teaching, teach sound doctrine and preach the true gospel, and to teach the church how to live godly lives. So again, we're seeing primary focus in missions from scripture is the gospel making disciples and local church which is being healthy and biblical um, and each person laboring with different gifts to see that ultimate thing happen and um, so we'll see other people who are uh, then so usually it's it's kind of helpful to, to think in categories the bible gives a few different categories of of missionary you have what's been called the paul type missionary who has a burden and an ambition to go to the unreached people groups and then you have what's called um, a Timothy-type missionary who's, who's still crossing cultural, geographical, um, and even at times linguistic um, barriers, but is laboring amongst churches that have already been planted, but is laboring to see that church get where it needs to be. Um, but then there's also a third category. Let's look at, you have um, some of other Paul's companions. You have Luke, Luke, um, Luke traveled with Paul, so you have the we section of Acts where he's saying we we concluded that God had called us to preach the Macedonian or to to preach the gospel to them. You know, Luke wrote that. He was, he was Luke's 
Luke was a doctor um, and was Paul's travel companions. Um, and so um, Luke, I'm sh- you know, was not Paul. Luke was gifted in different ways, but labored with Paul to see that ultimate end. And, you know, this is speculation, but you have got to, to assume that, that Luke used his medical, his medical, um, the fact that he was a doctor, his, his medical studies as a way to help people. I mean, what person knows a doctor personally as a friend and never asks them medical questions? I can't tell you how many people I've called. Hey, um, I'm being a cheapskate here. I don't want to go to the doctor, but this has been going on. What do you think it is? Should I go? You know, what person in history has not done that with a doctor friend? Um, but um, so we have Luke kind of being this category here. Um, and it says, Colossians will, will say, Luke, my beloved physician, Luke, the beloved physician greets you as does Demas. So he had other companions. Then you also had the faithful women and um, Clement. So it says, I entreat Eodia and I entreat Synthache to agree in the Lord. Yes, I ask you also, true companion, help these women who have labored side by side with me in the gospel together with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. And then you also have Prisca and Aquila, a married couple. It says in Romans 16, greet Prisca and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ Jesus who risk their necks for my life to whom not only I give thanks, but all the churches of the Gentiles give thanks as well. All right, so this married couple, all the, all the churches of the Gentiles, I'm sure, you know, Prisca, Priscilla, um, was not appointing elders. I'm, I'm positive she wasn't, because they're not called to do that. But she, so you could think, oh, she's not preaching and teaching. She's, you know, you know we don't need to invest a church invest money into them. You know, what are they? No, had a vital role in the field. Um, very used by God. So you have faithful women. Maybe these women were single. Who knows? Um, but then you have a married couple, and then you have different companions. Um, so as we could just see a couple of things from the biblical evidence, from what we just have seen, missionaries are committed to the preaching of the gospel, making disciples, planting churches, and raising up leaders. And we've also seen there's a wide range of variety of ways um, that God can call each um, missionary in the team to serve. There's unreached. People desire to go to the unreached. There's Timothy type. And then we have a third category who labor side by side together. So these people are maybe not the lead guy. They're not the pastor. They don't appoint elders or preach or teach, but they co-labor and have different giftings for the ultimate goal. Um, and so, um, just in conclusion, let's remind ourselves again what we talked about. Missionaries are those who are called by God, sent out from a local church who cross cultural, linguistic, or geographical barriers, along with a team of other believers, in order to preach the gospel, make disciples, establish churches, and train leaders in unreached areas and places. All right, so some things in the definition we did not cover but we might cover them in more detail another time. Um, Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, we just thank you for your grace that that you've shown us, and we just pray that you would just continue to be with us tonight as we continue to study. Um, Father, I just ask that, um, that, Lord, you would raise up people, Lord, to, to go and to take the gospel and to build up your church. Lord, we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.